How you doing? Hi, Christian. I'm doing good, thank you. There we go. Get it all. <clears throat> Excuse me, so you can see everything that's going on in there. What is going on in there? Oh, I like to make sure people see my uh, phone number and web address. That way, if they have any questions, they can get a hold of me. They can come to my website. Hey, if they like, they can actually donate. It's a, a lovely little bit of information. And what do you do, Hillbilly? Well, I used to be um, a mortgage loan officer, you know, writing loans for people. But uh, I got tired of uh, being told that I had to lie to people in order to get the loans to go through. So I quit. Uh, after that, I was a uh, bus driver for special needs kids. And I just love that. I love working with the kids. And, and they gave me all the real trouble cases because, number one, um, I'm Batman. And I, I had no problem telling the kids that I'm Batman. And I'll slap them down if they get in, in the trouble. Well, you can't do that legally. But they don't know that. So they, they were the best kids and we developed relationships. And then I had, uh, I don't know if it was a seizure or blackout or what it was, but then that kind of takes me out of being able to drive the bus anymore. I was going up a major highway, had two little boys still left on the bus. I had this little wink out thing where I think I passed out. I wake up and the tires are on the rumble strip. The bus is bouncing back and forth. The kids in the back are going, wee! And I'm like, oh my gosh, we're all gonna die. <laughs> So I had to resign that day. And ever since then, I've just been pretty much a, a stay-at-home uh, caregiver for my wife. She has a number of different illnesses, things like that, and a substitute pastor for a couple little churches here in the southern Indiana area. What do you do? Where do you live, Christian? I, I live in southern Indiana uh, in the United States. It's right across the river from Louisville, Kentucky, where they have the big horse race once in a year. Yeah, yesterday you said that you live on a farm and you have been around farm animals like for the past 20 years or something. Well, that was prior to moving up here. Um, I'm, I'm definitely a hillbilly. That's why my name is Christian Hillbilly. I'm a Christian first and a hillbilly, a husband, a father, everything else is second to my devotion towards God. But um, what gets me is people want to say all this scientific crud that this outweighs that. And the, the gentleman yesterday, he got so upset and, and he couldn't understand what was going on is it doesn't matter what you have on a piece of paper. If it doesn't work in real life, that piece of paper and all those numbers and algebra and everything like that, it doesn't work at all. And that's why he got so upset. Well, I have gotten a bit tired of Steve in several blubs I have been to, uh, I have noticed that his behavior is to crush them and swear everybody in the direction he wants to go. And he just does not let go. And today I have been thinking about it, what, how I feel about it really is. Um, basically, in the future, I will probably stay away from those blubs. I appreciate very much. I love science. I love, I appreciate being with other scientists. But I don't appreciate his attitude. It feels like he's dragging God every single time into the courtroom and he's playing the prosecutor. And it was okay. It was almost fun the first two times. But after a while, I'm starting to feel like who wants their dearest, most precious father to be dragged into the courtroom and slandered around every single time somebody opens their mouth. So... um I, I personally have actually left a note on my Facebook page. Probably the sharings will get it to him or to other scientists who like to crush course, uh, blobs like that. Um, and I will read that for you because it was very important to me. Um, this, I think I posted it last night. Just a moment. Just a moment. Uh, right, here we go. Does anyone enjoy their family being dragged to court investigation daily? I don't think so. Why should then Christians find it enjoyable that our father is dragged to court and accused by some investigation every day? It is designed to ruin our family time, 
whenever these so-called scrutiny sessions hit in unexpected, just in any blab. Time for scientists to ask for permission before crushing a blob again. As far as I am concerned, some of them I will be avoiding for their very style is accusing instead of friendly conversations. It should be common courtesy, but it isn't. I am always a good shopper for fascinating and highly entertaining deductive conversations, but will refuse to burn up too many stress hormones in sacred places where spiritual nurturing should be at least at much, that much of an e emphasis. God is my father. Please stop dragging him into your courtrooms in my presence in the future. I will not be cooperating anymore. Aloha. <laughs> I like that. Besides, well, um, actually, this morning, and just one more thought, um, Christian, here that yesterday, this morning I was thinking about what I should have said yesterday, because the Bible is a constant problem for them, is that if they are attacking any other, um, like Norwegian religions or ancient religions, ancient books, or is it only the Bible they are? And um, I, was, I was going to challenge Stevie the idea of, this book, the Bible, is a love letter from God oh, to amen. his people who love him. It's a love letter. It was written for me. Do you love him? Because if not, it's not for you. Read something else. And I am not going to feel bad about it because, um, because all Christians should be Push, shoving down the Bible on everybody's throat in order to enlighten them. No, it's the Holy Spirit's job. Unless they feel the call and the love, they shouldn't even touch that book. It was written for me. It's a personal love letter. And I am fed up from being taken to court every single time they feel like it. Go and study Northern mythology, Egyptian mythology. Study something else. But if you, if you want to prove me that my father lies to me, you have a tough time ahead of you. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you know, that, that was the one thing I really think got Steve really upset was, um, uh, number one, you were telling him straight up, hey, look, I, this is not my best area and, and stop doing this. And he wouldn't do it. And then when I finally came up on uh, to the blab and was able to refute everything he was saying and not only do so um with science but with very basic science we don't have to have a phd or 14 letters behind our name in order that's to see what I into. It, and, and that's Is exactly that what i was ta talking about you know we can actually study god's word study his creation and once you do that you i mean it's very very simple it's it's so simple a child couldn't understand it, but it's also so deep that, that the best scholars studying the word will never, ever get finished understanding the depth of the love that God has for us. And I think that's what really set him off. But and I've seen I've been doing this for 20 plus years, about 22, I think now. But I've seen all kinds of people. And when they get mad like that, it's because they know that they have lost the conversation, argument, debate, whatever they're calling it, they know they have lost and they have no comebacks at that point. So they have to uh, rely on getting rude, vulgar language or attacking the messenger and ad hominem attack. That's right. That's why I wrote it on the side last night that now it comes to discredit the witness. Maybe I'm not an expert witness in what is it called? Um, Evolution. I know enough about it to call it devolution, to be honest. Exactly. Not, not, not everybody has to agree with me on that either. But um, much, much more superior scientists than Steve are admired by my way of thinking and will prove and be challenged and enjoy it instead of attack it. But mm -hmm. the, to discredit the witness and discredit the expert witness is the prosecutor's job in the courtroom, which is the very reason why I have recognized what he's doing. 
and I am unwilling to drag my father into courtroom every single day for no reason. From now on, they're going to have to come up with a very creditable, uh, build their case, I would say, and provide me with the papers ahead of time so I can do my research. You know, I'm not going to put up with this sudden drop my bomb on the last <laughs> gossip news, newspaper in science have revealed something new that I haven't heard of before. Right. I have never heard that words have been... But even that, it wouldn't disprove anything that my father said in the Genesis. Nothing. You were very right when you said that evolution is nothing more than the religion of atheists. Absolutely. My father was an atheist. I grew up in an atheist country, in an atheist family. I haven't seen the Bible until I was 20. And then I decided to leave my Hungary, Hungary as when I'm from the communist country. There, there is nothing that atheists cannot tell me because even though I, 20 years ago my dad died, he was a scientist. He was an atheist. And guess what? This morning uh, somebody posted about wishing happy birthday to Charles Darwin. And the, my note to it was, is yet another um, one who denied the Lord and died by suicide. Yep. Most brilliant. Atheists I know, including my father, scientists and researchers, every single one of them drops by suicide. There is a pattern to be recognized, to be seen. I don't see, say that it is 100% certainty that an atheist is going to die with suicide, but it happens often enough that they alarm you. My book started dropping from the shelf. <laughs> <laughs> well, when it comes right down to that, you know, they have faith in their belief system. And once they say, oh, well, you, you rely on faith and us as scientists, we rely on science. Well, that's when I love to tell them that science is Christianity's best friend because we have testable, provable, repeatable, observable evidence for God's word in Genesis. That This has been my favorite book um, since basically day one because when you look at day one, all of our uh, society's uh, foundational uh, edicts all come from Genesis. Um, you know, sin, salvation, clothes. I mean, all these different things come. Marriage comes from Genesis. Well, the, the whole thing is, is you can get past the first verse and believe that. Then the rest of it's child's play. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when you think about that, if you can get past that with no problem, everything else is going to be going downhill at that point. <laughs> That's why I love talking to people about Genesis. Yeah. Um, what, what was it? Um, there was something. Oh, no, it dropped my head. I had something on mind when you started talking. I was, no, <laughs> never mind. I forgot. But um, yeah, Genesis, Genesis is a very significant one. Very significant one. I have been listening to a lecture yesterday about it too. After we finished the conversation, and I, and I'm, I'm just, um, you know, they are so stressful, so exhausting. These eighties conversations. It is their belief. It is, it is their faith, really. Oh, absolutely. And you are right about that. Their conviction. And. Um, that's all there is to it. Um, let, let, let's, let's talk about something else. How about, how about you tell me a little bit about what, what you do? Like you do look after your wife and you are home because you are retired. But um, well, is I'm that kind of retired. I, uh, it's one of those things that I, I love being here and spending good quality time with my wife and my dog. Uh, we have a great old time, but I didn't really retire at the wisest time. It was one of those things that when my wife got sick, we burned through a whole bunch of money trying to keep her in medicines and doctors and stuff like that. Uh, so when I retired, I forgot about the fact you need to have money when you retire. <laughs> so, uh, well, doing, you know, doing school bus and stuff, I, uh, I like to uh, build websites. I love to do that. Um, I love woodworking. Um, that's one of my favorite things. And my wife and I, uh, we kind of team up on stuff like that because I cut letters and designs out on something called a cricket. 
and it'll cut the wood and then I can actually use that as a template or it'll cut the paper and then I can use that as a template to cut the wood that I need. So it's, it's really pretty cool. You see what I do, one of the things I do is that I invite Christians who are really good at something because everybody's, by, by the time your age, you have to be very good at something. <laughs> Or and be very good I, at being very bad. <laughs> <laughs> or being very good at evolution. Mm -hmm. So it's up to you. But what I have, what I'm trying to convince people in my church, and they are very shy. I hope you are not. Because I need some success stories. <laughs> and no, I think, um, I think I'm one of those things that good. nobody would accuse me of being shy. Um, I, oh, I'm, I act good. like I... I, I know everybody. It doesn't matter. My wife gets upset with me. Not really upset, but she, she'll sit there and go, oh, my gosh, here we go again. We'll go to the Walmart or any kind of store like that, and we'll be in the middle of the checkout. Next thing I know, it's 45 minutes later because we're talking to everybody in the checkout lane. So, yeah, I, I'm not known to be very shy. Okay, I have an idea for you. And okay. it could turn out to be really good for both of us because I need a success story. And I'm pretty sure that you could enjoy having some more money, just effortlessly coming in, right? Absolutely. It does not require any, more money. no investment. I'm not going to ask for your money whatsoever. Okay. Um, what I do on my website is that for everyday simple Christian people, they don't have to be doctors or highly educated of anything. I ask them to shoot six videos six or seven videos, I mean, it can be eight. It's up to you how much material you might have. Yourself, recording yourself, sharing your expertise, either it is woodwork or um, taking care of how you take care of your wife in a godly way or evolution, any subject whatsoever. You should the six or seven videos of yourself. You send them to me and I pack it up as a course, and I market it. Hundred percent goes to you, whatever it sells for. The reason why I do that is because when people click on your um, course in any platform like Udemy or other places, and I have a course builder, so I can make it look really professional. And when they click on it, they come to my website, and I use it as a lead magnet to draw people to my website hmm, and cool. i want to have like hundreds of people with hundreds of courses in my website um set in it is all christian website you can visit it it will be a podcast show advertising for it too there will be um big blogging and um, i am publishing a book that's going to also draw a lot of attention and i market it cool. so i'm looking into cool. A launch. I wanted it in February to release the podcast show to launch. So I'm working on that one very hard. And my book is in the final stages of publishing. Um, but by the end of March, I should be able to have in quite a lot of traffic. And so it would be good to have like five or more um, courses available by by willing people. And um, willing people by that mean if you are a good talker, make more than one course you know every single one of them will be on my website and on the platforms on the on the on the course platforms okay and uh, yeah. i teach biblical entrepreneurship and people will see my courses available and my coaching programs available when they visit your your um what is it called course as well uh -huh. And it would be costing uh -huh. like every download like thirty-seven dollars, and then the platform might takes like ten percent, three, four dollars of it. And I would generally be charging like thirty percent for my work, but until I have enough people signed up for success stories, I'm not even going to start charging. And if okay. the success stories, okay. if the success stories draw me a lot of attention to my other courses that are a lot higher price then I then I'm not even going to ever charge for it because then I'm just going to be happy with serving Christians with a high traffic platform for their courses. Hmm, Making money. And if, if, once good. you once you have it have you have yours in there, 
my other friends I'm trying to convince in months might feel like much like it also because if you if you make like a thousand dollars a month we're going to put you on a success story advertisement everywhere I can I can show it to my friends and they will want to do it too okay so well, that's okay. my benefit well, I do that uh, I've done it for a number of years, years. Oh, I number years. Years. I'm going to turn it down here a little bit but uh so oh, I, for- I don't I don't there is something with your mic it's kind of like an alien that's what you sound like <laughs> okay hang on a second how about now is that any better much better okay good um what i do or what i what i have been able to do is i am what's called a google certified educator um i teach people how to use google um, and, and their different platforms, uh, Gmail, how to get Gmail to work at, at its most, how it integrates with uh, the calendar, the Google Docs, Google Voice, which people don't know about. It's a free phone you get with the Gmail service. Uh, I mean, all that. Then I also show, I've shown realtors in the past when I used to be in the mortgage industry, how to use these free services in order to, you know, propagate and spread your message. Um, I also do that for friends of mine, uh, especially when it comes to people who are trying to get their business going, uh, that don't have a lot of money. I love to jump in and I'm actually getting ready to help a uh, friend of mine who owns a martial arts, a karate place, um, get started. Uh, and it's just a lot of fun for me to do that. Plus I do sermons. I, you know, I do sermons, I do topics. Uh, sometimes they'll go for 30, 40 minutes. Sometimes they'll go for two or three hours. And at that, when I do those type of things, I allow for questions at, at the end. And that way, those I've, I've dealt with just about any kind of question that you can think of. After doing this for 20 years, I'm very rarely surprised. So, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to do something like that. That sounds like a lot of fun. You see, it costs you nothing. It costs me nothing. And when we, because I already have everything set up for it. For my own purposes, it not this cost me cost me money, but it does not cost me extra money that I anyway would be spending. And it, there is no reason why we couldn't be creating value like that. Right. People would love it, and I can take it into the different platforms, and um, it would give me also a chance to see what actually works. Because you will be my first customer in this project. Okay. Well, that sounds good. The other reason I like to use this is because the place where I'm doing uh, almost all of my preaching right now is a little church in a town called New Market, Indiana. And about five, six years ago, there was a tornado that came through there and just leveled the place. Um, But it's trying to come back. There's a lot of older folks in there, a lot of people that... uh, you know, 70, 80s, uh, most of their kids are going to the mega churches that are in our area. And I'm trying to figure out ways to help them rebuild the congregation to get people active and excited about coming back. I'll tell you how far out in the country they are. They do not even have running water. It's an outhouse is the bathroom. You see, I can even help you with that. I can That's even right. help you. Well, because... <clears throat> because what I do is I teach biblical entrepreneurship. And mm-hmm. I know that you are very knowledgeable, but I know only a handful of people around the world who actually look at the Bible as an entrepreneurial blueprint given by God. You see, when God has inspired me after he saved me, he, ins- he showed me the vision that he imagined as the kingdom enterprise. Mm-hmm. And he is the ultimate entrepreneur. And anybody who wants to work and do business with God first have to be acquainted into his enterprise. You can't go there with a set mind. This is what I want to do and keep praying for it and expect that God is going to provide. Oh, absolutely. One of my favorite sayings to people is, you want to hear God laugh? Tell him your plans. (laughs) Because, you know, when you think about it, we, we tell ourselves that we want to be followers of Christ, that we want to love God with all our heart. And then we try and push God in the direction we want to go. It doesn't work that way. So, yeah, I'm very familiar with that that uh, platform that you're talking about. 
that not many people actually can read the Bible and discover and see what the kingdom enterprise is about and mm -hmm. how it's supposed to behave as subcontractors, intrapreneurs to his enterprise. Every, every kingdom business on earth is an extension of heaven. Every human heart that has God dwell inside it is heaven because the word heaven means the dwelling place of God. Mm -hmm. So if you accept him into your heart, you are in heaven. And I know I am. And well, that's what I, 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 I may disagree with you just a little bit on that. When we accept God into our heart, we are on the path to heaven. But I tell you what, where I live, this place ain't hit heaven. <laughs> but I tell you what, uh, when it comes right down to it, uh, when I was in the mortgage industry um, and they first started having this uh, campaign to defeat uh, natural traditional marriage and everybody was, oh, homosexuals need to be allowed to do whatever they want to do. They were already being allowed to do what they wanted to do. They just want to kill off marriage. So one of the things that I had uh, in my um, uh, header and my footer for my uh, stationery Every time when I sent a document out, it didn't matter who it was. Every single one down at the bottom had my verse. That, that was my work verse. And that's Colossians 3.23, work hard and cheerfully as though you're working for the Lord rather than working for people. And a lot of Christians mis misread that. Oh, wait a minute. That's talking about slaves and slaves. Yeah, it was specifically speaking to a slave, but aren't we all slaves? Aren't we all slaves to, to this world and having to make a buck to, to feed our families? But if we do it the right way, if we do it the way God calls us to do it, not only will it spread the good news of the gospel, but it'll be so much yeah. easier for us to do because we, we will enjoy yes. it so much more. Because once you have to make something right, behind you are it. doing your niche. That's the way you're supposed to do it. It's not a, it's not a, a draining experience anymore. It's something that pumps you up and you want to keep doing it. Yes, we. If if you want God's support, you believe in Him, then start to do what He wants us to do, and we have the greatest supporter. In the whole universe. If God is for us, who can be against us? <laughs> yeah. Well, I it, it is very check on my missus. Uh, the phone just rang, so I got to go check on my missus. I'll be right back. Okay. Well, my Bible just opened at First Chronicles chapter 11. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David unto Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, thou wast he that ledest out and broughtest in Israel. And the Lord thy God said unto thee, Thou shalt feed my people Israel, and thou shalt be ruler over my people Israel. Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king of to Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. And David and all Israel went to Jerusalem, which is Jebus, where the Jezubites were. the inhabitants of the land and the inhabitants of Jebus said to David thou shalt not come hither nevertheless David took the castle of Zion which is the city of David and David said whosoever smiteth the Jebusites first shall be chief and captain so Job or Joab, the son of Zeruiah, went first up and was chief. And David dwelt in the castle 
Therefore, they called it the city of David. And he built the city round about, even from Milo around about. And Joab repaired the rest of the city. So David waxed greater and greater, for the Lord of hosts was with him. These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him in his kingdom and bid all Israel to make him king, according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. And this is the number of the mighty men whom David had. Yashobim, the Yachmonite, the chief of the captains, he lifted up his spear against the three hundred slain by him at one time. And after him was Eliezer, Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite. who was one of the three mighties. He was with David at the pass Dammim. And there the Philistines were gathered together to battle. There was a parcel of ground full of barley and the people fled from before the Philistines. And they set themselves in the midst of that parcel and delivered it and slew the Philistines and the Lord saved them by a great deliverance. Now three of the 30 captains went down to the rock to David into the cave of Adullam. And the host of the Philistines encamped in the valley of Rephaim. And David was then in the hold of the Philistines' garrison, was then at Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem that is at the gate. And the three break through the host of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and the kid and brought it to David, but David would not drink of it, but poured it out to the Lord and said, my God forbid it me that I should do this thing. Shall I drink the blood of these men that have put their lives in jeopardy? For with the jeopardy of their lives, they brought it. Therefore, he wouldn't, would not drink it. These things did these three mightiest. And Abishai, the brother of Joab, he was chief of the three for lifting up his spear against 300. He slew them and had a name among the three. Of the three, he was more honorable than the two, for the, he was their captain, howbeit he attained not to the first three. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done many acts, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. Also, he went down and slew a lion in a pit in a snowy day. And he slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high, and the Egyptian's hand was a spear like a beaver beam. And he went down to him with the stuff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and slew him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, 
and had the name among the three mighties. Hey there, Maya. I hate to interrupt because I uh, love reading the scripture, but um, I've got to take off. I should be back online in about an hour or so. Yeah, I had the intention to talk about the role of compassion in the marketplace. I will see if anybody comes to have that conversation. If not, I will be shutting down. But it was nice meeting you, Christian. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to give you my email address. Uh, let's see here. If I can type fast enough. There we go. That's my email. 